Ground Zero taking the third game of this best of five is just looking more and more formidable. The scaling on the Lee Molder absolutely crushing it at the end there with that beautiful quadra kill in their base. What more could you ask for, Tally? Yeah, what more could you really ask for? I, I think that what we're seeing throughout this series is, you know, development of, you know, they're trying to match up to the power of Ground Zero, but they're not matching up in terms of scaling. So, you know, something has to change. And if that's going to be like, okay, run back the same draft, but okay, let's not prioritize the Ezreal. Let's pick that scaling option for Violet in the bot lane, where that's going to be, you know, something like a Kai'Sa or just a genuine, you know, other AD carry or holding the bot lane pick four, four, five. You know, I just want to see something change. Even if it's going to be, you know, Harry back on a mage and Kevy playing an AD jungler. They just need to have more like end, end game uh, agency. No, 100%. And that's actually something me and Skimmy mentioned literally just then. We talked about the skill. The skills of these players are so close. Like everyone is so good at what they do. They know what to do. They've got the idea in their head. The difference is it feels like Violet isn't giving sort of maybe the tools that he needs. They're putting him on the Ezreal. It's just not hitting the mark we feel. Yes, it's a very strong pick, but it probably could be with something a bit better because the Smolder again just scaled into Oblivion Skimmy. Well, that's it. I mean, that's why we were wondering during the draft, oh, is this like a Zeri bot lane? Are we going to get a mid Israel, which would have been pretty exciting because I know that Violet can go absolutely crazy with it. This is bread and butter for many years in the LCO where you'd give him a Jinx and a Filios or Cogmore, any of these champions that can 1v9 late game, and he would be that guy. So he's not really getting a, a sort of a, a true test to contest this uh, uh, Smolder, right? Because he's always grouping up with his team, saying, let's go fight. Oh, we didn't get any wins. We didn't get any kills. That sucks, because I've just watched like a like a hyper carry scaling crit champion just farm up like four waves, and yeah, I'm falling further and further behind now. Well, that's exactly it, right? Like, I think that the scaling on uh, Smolder is so big, and the fact that the meta defines that the support should be roaming up, helping with grubs, looking to support their jungler more so than the AD carry, you can't leave a champion like this in the bot lane, and 26,000 damage is just chump change for this little dragon, who is so comfortably at the end there. But you even look at the gold graph as well, it just was so even for 15, almost 20 minutes, and then just woof blew out of control and it just looked so good for ground zero but again tally does this now mean you need to change up your bands in regards to this support this uh 80 carry sorry uh i think that what we're seeing is you know they really don't want to give the, the tristana open because they don't want to give you know the champ who just has the agency in the mid lane but i think the other bands have been changing a lot throughout the series so we're curious what is going to come back to on you know their first three bands in the draft but i like i just have to keep thinking about the fact that we are just seeing the you know every single game ground zero is developing you know their drafts a, a bit better than the side of bliss bliss is trying to catch up but it seems to be one step behind and i think that step right now is just you know something that just is that late game win condition you know it, the camille's the 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 the, the affiliates is the jinx the the zeri is just these champs that just take over the game when they hit their thresholds but it's not seeing them come out of bliss but you know what's also very interesting to me, Pike, is the fact that they're actually banning away Caitlyn and Misfortune themselves, are Bliss. Yeah. And you're thinking, if you kind of want that balance between early game and late game, why not play something like Caitlyn, right? You can crush it during the laning phase, which is their clear uh, identity. And because you did so well in the early game, that mid-game weirdness for Caitlyn isn't actually an issue, right? As opposed to like, okay, guys, let me just be invisible for like 10, 15 minutes now. Now I'm late game. Now I'm a Caitlyn that can hit you from like a million miles an hour. Um, yeah, it's it's very interesting. I, I'd love to see some hyperscaling for Violet in particular. Well, we'll have to wait and see as the game is getting ever closer, but we've got a side select ready to go. Let's see where Bliss wants to go, and they've picked blue side this time, Tally. Yeah, so I believe the reason why Bliss did pick red side initially is, you know, we remember that series back where, you know, Tien picked the Camille on three and they banned two, you know, top laners from Bayern. He had no answer to deal with that champion. So that was that GG game state for Tien when, you know, he is unleashed on the Camille in a pretty good matchup. So them going to the blue side means that, okay, it's probably going to be a ban that they have to get rid of. And they, you know, obviously want something in the priority where it's going to be the Leona or, you know, the, the Tristana or just something for Harry to take over this mid lane. I think that Leona was just so powerful too, like Kurak just unleashing it as well. But again, looking at all three games here, Skimmy, something has to give because Ground Zero, they're on match point. This is make or break. That's exactly right. And I think this is going to be the first of those big adaptations that need to happen, right? The first time in this series that Bliss will be playing on the blue side. Look, they're trying to change things up a little bit. It's not been working on the red side. Yes, they got that one win, but it's all fizzled out. You thought maybe there's a little bit of momentum that builds from that, but it's uh, yeah, completely gone against them. And now you're hoping to see something really impactful come out on that uh, on that first pick for them. And I mean, if you look at their recent games, what it has been is usually like a Sejuani, Ezreal, or Ash. Um, and I'm, I'm sort of wondering if in this series those are still very relevant. Because whilst we're screaming, get rid of Ezreal, it leaves up the likes of a Sejuani and an Ash. And a Sejuani that's been let through 
Um, never, because Grand Zero are always banning it away. Look, we'd like to see a bit of Sejuani, the Hulk making it out onto the Rift. We haven't seen it in a hot minute, but we'll have to wait and see what it'll be. Uh, I am enjoying... I want to see Smolder back in it again. What do you think, Tally? Would you like to see the Smolder back, or do you think the, the potential of it being banned is pretty high? I don't think Smolder will get banned. It's just a lot of boxes need to be ticked for the champ to come out. We even saw how bad that early game was going for them on the bot side, so if it does not have that, okay, when we hit this point in the game with GG, there's just no reason to pick it. So unless we see this edge will prioritized again by Bliss, I do not expect to see the Smolder come out. Well, do you think they're going to prioritize it, or do you think Tristana is going to maybe make a bit more of a show? Because I feel like the drafting right now, Bliss just haven't got their, like, maybe they haven't got their finger on the pulse, right? Whereas Jeezy's like, now nah, we know what we need to do. We're, we're at that next stage. How can we accelerate it further? I feel like Bliss is just trying to catch up a little bit. I, I think, like, it's a Tristana yeah. first, but okay, they've, they've been batting it themselves. Mm. Uh, no, go ahead, Sally. Uh, no, I was just going to say, uh, I think, I, like, honestly, I think Violet would be delusional to play Ezreal again, just based on this game state. Like, he gets fed, you know, he's having really good games in the champ, he's having really good lane phases, but it, his damage isn't sticking, right? Like, he he needs to land every Mystic shot in every single team fight. every scenario has to be so perfect, so, you know, just give yourself some, you know, uh, area to work with and just lock yourself in something that you can still perform on. It's about hitting those Mystic shots, and just like me, I'm going to be shooting my shot with your Twitch channel points one more time. Get them into there. Yeah, I got you with that one, didn't I, Skimmy? I saw that. Yeah, yeah you got me there, mate. <laughs> That's too easy. That was a good one. Get them in and make sure you're back your favorite team. This could be the last time. For a long time, you get to put in your Twitch channel points in the LCO because PCS is so, so close. You'll have to start stacking there too, but it is the potential for GZ to close out this series in this next game. And your predictions, gents, could come to fruition. But before we even get to that, we will go to a short break so we can get ready for game number four. Yes, it could be the final one. Ground Zero sitting comfortable at 2-1 against Team Bliss. We'll have to see who's going to take home that trophy. We'll see you there. Hey okay, guys, it's Tim. I'm down here at Fortress and we are with... I'm Terry, not Terry or Mia. <laughs> Who is famous for? Uh, I'm currently the runner of Summoner Society. Shout out Sumsock. Applause <laughs> uh, from the audience. Do you have a prediction? Um, look, I'm a bit of a Team Bliss fan, so I think they're going to bring it back. I think we're going to go to five games. We're going to have two straight wins for Bliss now. <laughs> I will not argue with five games. Let's go Bliss. I don't have a favourite. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Back to you guys. Hey guys, it's Tim down here at Fortress. Actually, I'm going to start without that one this time. Hey guys, I'm here with... Sophie. Sophie? Sophie, who's your favourite champion? Um, my favourite champion is Lulu. <laughs> Lulu, okay. Shout out all support mains. Never ask them why they have 79% win rate on Ringer. <laughs> um, do you have a prediction? Um, I'm a bit biased because I love Lemus, so I really want Ground Zero to win, but I wouldn't complain with five games, so... Hey, it can still be five games and a Ground Zero victory. What did you think of the Smolder? I loved it. I love Smolder. He's such a cute little dragon, so I was really excited to see it. Can we get your best mom? No, I won't make you do that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you very much.
And here we go then, it's a match point here for Grand Zero. One game away here, Tally, and they can claim the trophy for the second time in two splits. Back to back they would be. As for Bliss, it really is that case of we've made it to PCS, but that's not enough. We need more. They absolutely need more. And, you know, we were talking about it behind the stage, but this is, you know, the potential last game for Bliss. So this is the time where, you know, all that prep you went for, all those potential, you know, weird drafts or weird strategies, this is when you pull them out because you have nothing to lose. This is that last game. You know, you kind of lost all that pressure off the back of you in the series. And we saw, uh, you know, in that first game, how well Bliss were performing when they felt there was no pressure for the series. But as the uh, the games have mounted, as the series has gone on, it looks like that pressure is starting to come back. So I hope that we finally get to see Bliss like unleashed again and playing a style where, you know, they look most comfortable. Take us back to that game one. We're going for a very heavy dive composition. We're playing aggressively. Uh, and you might say, Tally, they're breaking bad a little bit there as well. I'd be quite excited to see what comes out of that one. Because, hey, if we see no Ezreal, our hands are up. We're happy. We're smiling. Absolutely, yep, cinema. Please, Ezreal, do not get picked. <laughs> Lemus can, <laughs> pick, can pick it. So then he loses, and then we go to game five. But Violet, no Ezreal. I want to see the scaling. I want to see just, you know, these team fight comps come forward. Yeah, we certainly do. So we go then. It's Bliss fighting for the blue side the first time in this series. As a result, the bans will have to change. And have been a few crucial adaptations. Bliss self-ban of Tristana, electing for a first pick Cassante. So they just want to remove any volatility from the mid lane. But yeah, the first pick Cassante is a strange one for me because uh, I, I can kind of understand it, right? Because, you know, there are still quite a few mage junglers left up and they are happy to trade them. And maybe they believe that uh, the Cassante is just a standalone pick that doesn't really have anything to match up to it because we saw Bayer quite happy to play the Nar into it, but with, uh, you know, Tien's Camille being gone, is he happy to play the, the Nar into it or is he just going to go for something like the Renekton? Well, that's the question, right? What is the best matchup into this that Tien wants to play? We know that Zoranus would say this is a Twisted Fate angle. You know, Dorymon would say this is a Zeri top angle. But what does Tien want to fare into that champion? Granzo are currently hovering the Zyra. They themselves actually not banning the Orianna anymore on the red side, letting that one through, taking away the Leona instead. And it is locked in and so is the Nautilus. So Grand Zero, you know, recognizing, okay, the Leona is gone. It's all about this agency in the bot lane, pairing it up with the, you know, the jungle support synergy. They go for the next best pick in the Nautilus. And the fact that, you know, all of a sudden, Aldor's choices are the Rel, the Alistar, all going back to that Brawn that just really didn't pair up well with the junglers, you know, probably makes him feel quite uncomfortable in the scenario. 
It certainly does. And it really is your bread and butter of giving yourself that best possible chance of engage. Ash being looked at right now. And if that gets locked in, our prayers have been answered. My hands are off the keyboard. We finally are away from the Ezreal. So now all of a sudden, Violet, you know, is playing that champion who can output an insane amount of DPS in the in the late games and has some more agency with the arrow. So Shernfire, someone who's always out of position to try to steal away these camps, try to get these grubs. Uh, all of a sudden, there is that pick tool on the side of Bliss, and he has to be very conscious about that one because if they pair it up with something in the bot lane, having all this, you know, team fight agency is so important for how Bliss want to, you know, come out of the gates this next game. Well, it's going to be the Alistair that combines with the Ash, it would seem. It's uh, going to be a nice way for them to answer back. We saw this was a very comfortable matchup, at least the Alistair Nautilus, uh, when Alistair had to face up against Dragku. What is it then that Grand Zero want to lock in this first three? Do they feel compelled to guarantee a matchup into this uh, Cassante? Or do they say, you know what? Back to center. We're the only team in the region that still wants to play this. And I like that. And this is just a really, really good adaptation by Grand Zero. They recognize the first three on Bliss, really low damage, right? So, you know, Lemus, extremely flexible players. Like, okay, correct, you can farm up. You can become the super frontline for our team. We're gonna have Tien probably also play a Bruiser or a Tank on the top side of the map. So all of a sudden, uh, Violet, without those, like, you know, the four items, or even if he has to go for that full DPS build, uh, he's gonna be quite squishy without lifesteal in his uh, build when there's so much AoE from, like, the center hole, the Zyra poke, and potential other picks coming out the rest of the draw. This is a really good first three by Ground Zero. It really is, and I've got flashbacks, if you remember their series last time up against Bliss, where uh, it was Kurek underneath the tower, he got dived on by Elidoric and Violet, he survived, and he got kills on them in response, so... Hopefully, none of those uh, fancy shenanigans occurring again as the Orinara does get banned away. Bliss respond back by taking off the Corky. So that mid lane pool is getting more and more pinched by the minute. And you're wondering, all right, what comes out in response? Is Lucian still the go-to AD option? Or do we start to default to other ideas? And I think that Ground Zero also getting a read of what Bliss won. I think we're probably going to see them go more towards that mage in the mid lane, you know, Harry potentially on the way, a champion who's really, really good into Zyra in particular. I'm curious if they do want to go for this control mage in the mid lane. I would personally like to see them go for this, uh, you know, front to back style. But, you know, in saying that, Zyra is so good into, you know, all the melee that Bliss have shown so, so far. So Shernfai is completely happy with this draft dynamic and how it's worked out for him. I'm sure he's cruising. Probably doesn't really care too much as to what they lock in. Knows exactly what they're about, which is disruption. We've got the knockups from the Nautilus. We've got the plants for the roots for the knockup also with the ultimate there too. And now you wonder, how do you want to bring this all together? You saw the Lux and you're thinking, that's uh, not going to be it. More disruption in with the Poppy. Yeah, so Fido really wants to get himself that good matchup with the mid lane. You know, blind picking the Lucian is fine, but we'll have to see what he does want. He does want to play the AD option, but a lot of his champs are removed, so uh, it's just to have to see if he does have more picks that we haven't seen yet. A lot of his champs are gone and what Harry is going to go for because if Harry does play a control mage here, pair that with the AD jungler from Kevi, or if they do just go for their own AD mid laner and then, you know, just their own mage in the jungler, or in the jungle, uh, this is what it's going to look like and I want to know what uh, Fido is going to go for on 5 here. Well, before we get to that, we've got to figure out what is this mid lane matchup that Harry needs to pick here blindly. Lucian would seem to be the next go-to AD option if you want a little bit of ranged as well. And that's what he's going to hover. And that is the confirmation. So all eyes then turn to Fighter. How do you bring this comp together? How do you find that extra bit of damage to ensure that he stays as that solo AP? Oh, this would be a crazy read, Skimmy. This would be a crazy pick out of them. But, you know, they can just pick the AD. I was going to say, you know, the tank in the mid lane is completely fine because they do have those two carries in the back lane in Zyra and Senna. And the enemy team is quite low in terms of damage, so he can be this absolute brick, but there's going to be that AD carry match in the mid lane, and this is going to be that, uh, you know, Lucian can't dash forward outside the creep wave because he just gets hit with those mystic shots in the head, and as long as Ezreal maintains that passive, he can keep that push in the mid lane, and that's all Shonefire needs from his mid laner. Yeah, that attack speed push is just so, so devastating, right? So if you can weave that one in for ultimate uptime, then GG. Yeah, that wave is always going to be bouncing in your favor, and uh, Shonefire's going to have a fantastic time navigating. Well, I can go to literally any of these lanes, and I can find myself a ganking threat. And if you've not seen this uh, fasting center gameplay from Lemus in particular, he plays that a little bit differently to somebody else in the league. Uh, this is going to be a center that's going to be all over the map, basically a second support. Yeah, that's what Lemus really likes to do. He likes to run about Skimmy. I got to take you down memory lane a bit. The last okay. time Harry was in a finals in Oceania, 
he did lock in the Lucian in the last game he oh, played. No, oh no. So is this gonna be the repeat of that, you know, last game of the series Lucian curse? Or is he going to break that one himself and have the carry performance? Because I think in this game, he really is enabled. He has so much front line. He, you know, I think when he gets the items, the culling is gonna do so much damage to these squishy members if they're caught out of position and they can really blow over the enemy side. Really nice that they didn't go for, you know, the Ezreal this time and they do have consistent damage. They do have late game threat. They do have the, you know, agency from the support. So I think that we're in the, the fourth game of the series, but we're finally seeing these, you know, final forms of these comps from both sides. Both teams are evolving, finding their way into this one. As you mentioned there for, uh, for Harry, hopefully looking to try and get rid of some old cobwebs. Thankfully, he's not up against a set in the mid lane. That was his ultimate demise in the end on that one. We won't talk about who played that champion, but I'll tell you what, he'll be hoping that his second time in an Oceanic final fares a little bit better in his favor. But here we go, ladies and gentlemen, game number four. It's match point for Grand Zero. The favorites all season long, all series as well, have been Grand Zero as based on your channel points too. And they'll be showing that 3-1 is how this all ends up. We want to claim first seed as we represent the region in Taiwan. And it's time to find that skimmy if the Ezreal is cursed or if the bot lane is cursed. I, I, I think that Ezreal in the mid lane is quite different, you know, because you do have so much experience uh, compared to the bot lane. You can really mitigate that, you know, uh, DPS difference between, you know, the, the item breakpoints that you would have in bot lane. So I think that fighter is going to be doing a good job, especially because there's a lot more consistent damage from his team. He doesn't really have to be that late game threat this time. He just needs to output damage and create some, you know, adversity in these team fights for the rest of his team to really shine because Tien is on this matchup, Poppy into Cassante, and I think this matchup can swing into the Poppy favor really hard if Fire Panther messes up this early game. Not to mention, also when it comes to the team fights, right, going to be a bit of a nuisance to try and prevent Eladoric from finding those Dream Engages. And uh, oh, so the But uh, perhaps you just say Tien is really good at this champion. And he just concedes the first blood at the level one. But we are seeing the invade from Kevin again. Can he steal away this one? This might just come down to a smite fight from how much damage Shun is doing to this buff. Battle who can get the Skittles first and foremost. Picked up there by Shun. Five steady hands on the smite. But how does he get out of this situation? He's going to be forced to burn the flash. Especially now he sees three people up. He wants to fight Tally. He just wants to sit there for as long as he can before the inevitable has to occur. Oh, oh, oh wait. no, Shun. Uh, why? Why have we wrapped around there? Why have we wrapped around like that? That is a freebie. That is a gift that Bai will very happily pick up. Shone has read too deep into what the enemy was doing and did not expect them to be in the bush there. Thought they would just be stealing away the camp and he could maybe steal, you know, sneak that one away with a bit of damage, but disrespects his opponent and gets himself caught off guard there. But Tian just respawning, running bot, and they're just hitting this tower as fast as possible. They, you know, this is not what you're really, really going to see in the uh, lane swaps anymore, Skinny, right? Because these towers are significantly tankier and, you know, much harder to take down these swaps. So all you really do is you just navigate or you want to avoid that first three levels in these bad matchups. So it's where you see the Alistair and the Ash, you know, avoiding the, the center nor in the early game. They're just going to swap back afterwards and it's going to be much happier for, you know, both Bio and the bot lane on this side. But Bio TPing in has that Pathmaker, quite hard to dive. Yeah, you would usually say you need to get level two as quickly as you can, but he's got the path maker, he's got the red buff, and he's also about to die. Tally, it takes one more auto attack, and there it is. Picked up there by Liam, it's teeping into your own death. Feels a little bit rough there. And this is an early game like no other. Yeah, huge mistake from Bayer there. Okay, so number one, what you normally do on the Cassante is you just walk under the tower and you let them dive you, and you pretty much trade so much health that you can TP back in and not have to worry about anything. But the fact that Bayer couldn't react to the uh, the wall stun by Tien there and loses so much health before you get the Pathmaker off, falls down, can't walk back belt lane, and all of a sudden we see the TP topside, Tien level two, no dive pressure onto him this time. No dive pressure onto him, his tower's completely fine, you know, Still able to even get that first turret plate at this stage. Whilst you look at bot lane, you say, did they buff how tanky these towers were? Because I could not tell. That tower was already dead. And we're only four minutes into this one. But here comes Bliss, mounting their assault. You can be level two, but can you deal with four members pouncing upon you? Bai doesn't even care about laning. He really is that third support in this game. Still keen to make something happen. Still hunting for gold. And now there is the engage. Flash beautifully proffered as there is the flash yep. with the pulverize. But he's taking one. Can he make a second? He can! Oh my god, it's a denial. That's an execute going over the side of Bliss, but still Tien buys so much time. But the fact that they've gone three and a half plates on the bot side already is such a big deal. Nolus is so good at proxying his ways. I assume he has Demolish as well. So just a lot of damage being dealt to these towers. And it's such a big deal for the, what they're really looking at in the early game because you would have thought the, you know, the Ash was going to have some pride in the bot side, but they just really don't. And Simi going into this replay here, 
Tien unfortunately wasn't able to flash you know, in time, but still, because he's level 3, he buys so much time in the CC chain, and he's able to stun up Kevy under the tower, and he's the next one tanking this thanks to his E, just, you know, instantly applying the damage there. Yeah, the Defiler being a bit of a menace, and keeping him in mega range, being as close to combat as he is. And speaking of the devil, he goes in for a bit of a cheeky invade. Once again, Cinderella Crime, where he took down Shun 5-4, first blood, tried to find a little bit more but not to be found on this occasion. Nicely done there by Harry, hiding behind the wave to ignore that mystic shot from connecting and get the better end of the trade. And maybe now, maybe now, all the shenanigans are over. We can go back to some standard deployments here, Tally. And the real winner of this early game, even though he did die, is Shurnfire. He was clearing this entire time, but Kevy, you know, he's, he's participating in these tower dives. He's falling down in camps. He doesn't have camps to take because Shurnfire's already stolen them out of his jungle while he was busy on the top side, so... He is going to fall behind as this game goes on. Shurnfire on the Siren, who had a monster performance in that second game, is just going to continue doing so, Skinny. Definitely is going to continue to do so, making sure that if you're going to be ganking as this uh, calf is, I'm going to put you further and further behind. That map information is invaluable. Gives me all the time I need to react to recalculate what my next best uh, optimal path would be. And Philemus and Kurak, I mean, they must be absolutely chuckling about how this first five minutes have played out. So many plates gone, so much gold acquired. And if they can find even more push here with Schoenfire, I mean, yeah, it's going to be a long time before Violet can look to answer back. Looking for a potential gank onto Aladoric there because he does not have Flash, but you know, they're respecting the size of the wave and the fact that Kevy could be in that lane, and if they did participate or commit to that gank, and Kevy is there, that is going to be that swing happening and lights out. But still hanging around both sides, and Aladoric still no Flash. No hook though for Kurak, unless he can find it right there. There it is, he breaks the ranks by hitting the flash, and Eladoric is a sitting duck. No chance to respond, and no chance to defend, as this tower, I said it was gone at five minutes. It's going to get crashed here now, and with the assistance of Schoenfire hovering, he takes your camps, he takes your lane, and Violet completely zoned. And this is not the Schoenfire we know, Skimmy. Grubs are up, but he is not participating in this one on the top side of the map. But both solo layers from Blizz are here. Yeah, they certainly are. Kevy under threat right now. Fighter trying to weave his way with those skill shots. Spread the line, if you will. But uh, two of those grubs go the way of Bliss. Violet yet again is still the focus. And Aladorg's only just got back to lane. He's flashed to try and get underneath his own tower, Telly. That's how desperate we are. Seven minutes in. He's only just picked level going? four. Running away from the tower now. But the tower range has dropped. He's going to fall to the center route. Picked up in the end by Kurak, who gets knocked into the tower. It's not lethal. Just not find the trade kill there, and Schoenfire just, you know, trading the top side of the map, recognizes he's so far ahead, he doesn't need to grow his lead. He can just uh, explode the only win condition left on Bliss, which is the bot lane right now, and make sure they can't play the game, but they're still walking, they're going for Violet. He has his own flash this time, Skinny. What does he decide to do here? Surely we don't play underneath this tower. Surely it's the end to what has been a very, very cha uh, chaotic and crazy early game, with the first tower then falling. Maybe a chance to perhaps freeze the wave and just say, get me back in this game because but it's not weak. He's just getting completely zoned out. Oh, oh my no. God, that arrow, that arrow. <laughs> and something to touch on Skimmy, they got the first tower. That's five plates in the pocket. Lemus has, he already has his swiftness boots. He already has his wards completed. So he can now run around the map with churn fire, drop vision everywhere. Whereas you look at the other side, this is a level four Alistair, no wards, no major item completed. He is not strong and in these skirmishes, even though Kevy is level six, he cannot match up to what Shurnfai has in his inventory right now. Terrifying start to the game here. And uh, you really are hoping that things simmer down in a second because to already be up by that amount of gold, 2k at eight minutes in, is criminal. Grand Zero really are just upping and upping the, the, the revs on that speedometer every single time. They show no signs of slowing down. Yeah, and that's what Bliss re really needs right now. They need this game to slow down. They need to, you know, buy time so their AD carries can both hit the Kraken power spike. They need Carthus to get his first item. And they need this game state to really benefit Bio because he is that, you know, major side lane threat for them. They need the flanks to really come through. So as long as it's just going to go back to farming and a lot more scaling, this will be very good for Bliss because they shouldn't really be able to do anything in this early game based on how much control Ground Zero have gathered from that initial lane swap that actually came out of Bliss. No, it certainly did. In the case of Ground Zero saying, well, we'll just punish you for that one. And that has to feel bad. Violet's been locked in place. The hook to start it off. The center route to follow. The cleanse that comes up before the ignite was applied. And a Dawning Shadow that has to be flashed away from. It could have been a double kill, but Lemus will. will settle for a single kill. And Fado will say, you know what? I'll finish the job. Mystic shot. Doesn't even need it. Just weaves in two autos. And now Kevy being invaded in his jungle. Oh no, it really is going from bad to worse right now. Shurnfire finds another kill and makes the 
Jungle gap widened that much further. Requiem's not enough to find anything. It pads them low. Perhaps an assist can be found if Harry can play cleanup crew, but Schoenfire goes oh, to safety. Man. They're culling with the angle. It's just not ideal. And Grand it's almost like they're playing with their food. And they are just attacking on every stage of the map, Skimmy. Top side, bot side, they're everywhere. Fido finding that winner to move and clean up that kill is such a big deal. And the fact that, you know, Aldor can't even block Hawks through his AD carry lane because if he gets hit, he will also die. So Violet's only play there was to play to dodge that one. But since it landed, that meant Aldor fell down and then later on Violet. But with the ult coming out of Kurak down, no summons on Violet, even more threat onto his bot lane. I'm not sure what you do at this stage of your bliss. You feel a little bit desperate already this early on into a game to figure out what is our, our answer back. What is the catalyst to regenerate? Because you've dragged Kevy out of his lane. He's thinking, I need to gank. Not the ideal situation as a Carthus, but the wall of pain goes down. You think maybe, just maybe that's enough in tandem then with an engage off this Ash and Alistair. It's simply not though. And this entire half of our uh, top half rather, of the map is lit up red. Oh no. Shunfai knows exactly what you're doing. So if you spend all this time in the river, he tracks you, he can bring the boys and they can wrap around as a four man swarm. Trying to hit the Skittles. Doesn't find him, Skimmy. And that's just going to be an easy pick up for Shun. Once again, just. Kevy showing when he really doesn't need to, you know, he walks top, doesn't do anything for that, you know, proudiness on the top lane. There is no gank threat on these members. The experience difference is too large. They need to avoid these skirmishes. We look at the gold right now, it's almost a 5,000 gold lead at 11 minutes into the game. And their one, you know, winning lane, you know, was their bot lane and their mid lane. But the fact that these kills are going over to Fido and the 2v2 happened on that bot lane is so hard for Blizz to find any window back to this game. This feels like what uh, the PCS do to us. When we go overseas, right, we get crashed in at 10 minutes. We're thinking, oh, well, another year, another year of getting uh, stomped in as a result. But this is crazy from Grand Zero to respond on the fashion they did to be that well versed in understanding what Bliss's game plan was. And to say, now we've just got a better game plan. You need to conform to what we're doing as Bliss got the first three grubs. They're fighting. Grand Zero going to go for the second grubs. And well, Bliss really are going to say we need to fight tooth for nail for everything. This game is done if we don't find a little bit of retribution right here and now. Kevy takes out Schoenfire. That's not enough, however. They need more. They've taken two so far on the side of Bliss. The top half of their team is bleeding. And they'll find nothing more than just uh, a chance to reconsider their next team fight play. They get, you know, the one for two trade, but this is the teleport from the side of Bliss. You know, Bayer uses teleport to get here. This is three grubs going to ground zero as well, so this is still a huge win for them in this skirmish, and especially since the fact that Alodoric, you know, one of their main engage tools used their flash to get onto Schoenfire here, and the kill doesn't even go over to, you know, the Violet. It does go to, it goes to Kemi, who just really isn't having this in, uh, impact in this game so far, and I do not think this extra gold in is really going to change what these performances are going to look like for the rest of this, uh, you know, game skinny. I was beg the question, if panic starts to creep in at this level, you'd start to think, well, you know, yeah, what is our what is our answer back into this one? We've lost so much standing gold. It's been so hard for us to try and answer back and get turret plates of our own. We're all shoved up against our waves. And I think a lot of it's going to come down to, can we rally around Harry? Because in particular, he's been putting in a stellar performance here. Yeah, absolutely has been putting in a, a performance. Very consistent player, right? Always, always has, you know, good farm and he has an impact in the lane. But... Very hard position to do anything in this game. He needs his team to stand up so he can do damage. He's a low range AD carry. He needs that lockdown to do damage, or he needs time to really get to you know that level 16, that three, four item spike where the culling will just start shredding through the members of Ground Zero. Let's see what the next player would be. It seems that bot lane was a case of pushing in the wave. Once again, another lane swap flipped around. It's already going to be Grand Zero deploying their bot lane into the mid and saying, this is fine, another tower. There's nothing for us to play for in the bot lane anymore. We're just going to roam, offer protection for Schoenfire, offer a safe patch then to you know, lean over to Fido as we move over there too. And everywhere we pan to, Tally, it's just a case of waves being crashed and no match to be found. Alador can try to be cheeky and try to look for the poppy one more time. But it's just too easy. That's what this champion's designed to counter. And how do they dive him? He's so tanky. He also has the ult, so he can just knock them away if they really do commit. It's so hard for a Carthus who's behind and Alistair who's just, you know, not even Alistair. The fact that Violet doesn't have his cracking yet is such a big deal for dealing damage to this guy, Skimmy. They just keep trying and trying and trying. One day it'll work, guys. Trust me. Aladoric soaking up the entire Kevin's tower dead. right now, but he gets knocked away. So Kevy's going to get aggro. Kevy's dead. It's a fantastic trade again. 
And when will Bliss learn? You just cannot dive this Poppy. And it's just way too hard. And they're so down tempo. They lost. They already lost the outer tower. The members are collapsing onto mid. So this is now all of a sudden a two tower trade for one and a one for one in terms of the kill department. So just more wins for Ground Zero. More gold going towards these members. And this gold lead is just growing and growing and growing. Especially with you know them securing this Rift Herald. But we see the members of Bliss partying here, Skimmy. And I didn't. I'm not sure they want to give this one. I'm not sure if they really have a choice at this stage. They're not finding much success in the laning, so perhaps they can find some consolation in picking up some shutdowns. So they all pounce upon Lemus right now. Adodoro locked inside that pit. The Requiem to follow the culling out of range. And yet again, the opportunity cost keeps popping up, but keeps netting them at zero. And they're so desperate to find anything, you know, blowing flash culling is the last thing you want to be doing as uh, as Harry this game, but that's what they did just to try and find the kill onto Lemus, who's not even a shutdown, Skimmy, even after all this uh, pressure he's been putting out in this early game. This is Bliss constantly trying to fight. The way, the way you get back into the game is by fighting, apparently. It's not by scaling. Yeah, this is, this is very rough to see based on how the series has gone so far. We didn't expect it to be this... Uh, this! I, I can't even think of a word to try and describe it. I'm not sure what I'm really watching at this stage. This is a complete blowout. This is just Bliss coming out with a game plan in the you know the fourth game, the last potential game for themselves, and it just going terribly wrong, right? They go in for the invade, they did get the buff, they go for the dive, they trade one for one. They no, they trade one for two actually, with the you know execute going over the vial, but the experience still going to Tien. They you know try to play the the one v three outplay on the tower dive, they misplay it, so he now misses all the experience, and just everything went wrong for Bliss in the early game. And this is one of those you know uh, games where in scrims you would just pause and say, all right, GG remake. Yeah. It really feels that way, doesn't it? It's just a, a, a massive, massive knock-on effect from what you thought was the best-case scenario with that level 1 invade to where we find ourselves now. This is all the carries of Grand Zero with zero pressure, constantly pushing out these waves and saying, what are you going to do? We've got vision littered throughout your entire jungle. Shernfire can do no wrong. He's got the most farm in the game, uh, well, for his side anyway. Not to mention that Harry's still trying to trying to be that 1v9 performance, but this is this is rough orders. Yeah, it's absolutely extremely rough. And it, especially when you press tab and you look at the enemy's inventories, you look at ground zeros, uh, how much gold, how much experience they have, and the fact that, you know, Lemus on the center is as fed as an AD carry would be at this point in the game. And he's a player who's extremely good at getting souls, but what an engage. There it is. There it is. That's what we've been asking for. There's the Enchanted Crystal Arrow. The Strangle Fall Storm is a fantastic disengage tool. If you want to press on forwards, Zyra will not allow it. Shurnfire simply says no. He's denied the comeback potential. And they'll find yet another tower as that one is critically low. And I think that Fido has adopted the uh, the Kurak order, aura, right? Every time they try to engage with him, it goes terribly wrong and Violet. Walking back up, has he summoned this enemy, but it just doesn't matter. Yeah, he knows it's a done deal. And you can see the pure euphoria in Grand Zero's face. They know this game is so, so close to being done already. Nice heal there from Lemus. That may just be the difference. Preventing the one shot from the Requiem. But this is, yeah, this is not the way you want to see Bliss close things out. And it all starts with a fantastic engagement, just couldn't get it. And Correct does such a good job, you know, the 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 hook, the ult, you know, separating all the members on the enemy team. They cannot follow up that flash engage from Alodoric, especially since Fire is not here and he has no TP flanks to go to. This is a tough one, team. This is a, almost a 10,000 gold lead at 17 and a half minutes. And from a, a, a comp that doesn't, uh, you know, significantly outscale, it is so hard to get back into this game state. Which is what I'm really hoping for. I'm hunting for an out, an avenue, a, a, a way back in. Um, but this is very dire, to say the least. It puts a bit of a dampener on the grand final as a whole, right? It sounds very depressive, the tones of like, oh, well, the game's done already. It's only 17 minutes in. But, I mean, from what we've seen so far, Team Bliss's best avenue in is, well, let's just keep fighting. Let's just keep kind of find these picks. And here is attempt number five, Phyto. <laughs> Do you know? He is playing the Ezreal, so he can just farm his way from extremely long range. Elodork doesn't have the flash, but he has hex, does have Hex Flash. You want to charge that one, but Fighter has all the tools to outplay, and he has a show and fire in his pocket. Patience is the main virtue here, but if we look at the minimap, there are four members of Grand Zero saying, oh, no. well, that's fine. If you want to play that little bush party, it's not going to work out. Out comes the TP. The wraparound effect is there. Blue Trinket reveals. Astro doesn't connect critically from the mid lane. And surely that means they just can no longer win this fight. Bio jumps in, gets half his HP chunked out. Kevy tries to entertain something, but he gets instantly destroyed. Alatoric running for his life with the ultimate active. You wouldn't know it because he's still so damn squishy. As locked against everybody is Kurak, and he still survives. Oh, no. Kurak, you're so mad. 
Oh, he just never dies, Tally. He just simply refuses to fall on over. And Grand Zero just want this done at 20. And they absolutely do, Skimmy, and they absolutely can. This is just uh, extremely sad to watch, you know. Correct the fact that he can just walk into the four members there, walk it, walk it off. Yeah, look, look at his inventory, Skimmy. He has a frozen heart against double AD carries. There's going to be no armor pen coming through for any of these members on Blitz for such a long time. And I think that's just telling of, you know, the really, really good draft reads by Grand Zero. You know, last game, we saw them go for the really heavy scaling comp into, you know, the really passive uh, side of Bliss. And all of a sudden, this time, you know, Bliss have gone for a lot more aggression, a lot more early game. But this Nautilus, this center, is such a good answer to this. And, you know, as you can see this in this replay, they cannot get onto these members. Correct does such a good job at just locking down uh, members for sure by to lay out this damage. And just, it's so hard to you. I really don't know what to say. This is just really hard as a player to get back or think about anything, any way to get back to this game. And this is the kind of situation we'd be hoping, all right, go next game. You've got that luxury, right, of being on a match point, but it's on the other, other shoe, isn't it, right? It's not, it's not Grand Zero in this situation. And you were thinking if this is, you know, the blue side draft with all the different curveballs thrown this way, it simply hasn't been enough, unfortunately. And uh, yeah, to have everything exposed at this stage, the luxury would be, yeah, we've let your inhibitor stay alive. Uh, otherwise, that might be your ticket back in. You just keep wanting to fight us. Just farm some minions. Yeah, absolutely. But here's another arrow. No flash this time, Skimmy. Can they get him? Another arrow. Can we find Fido? Can we interrupt the perfect KDA? Can we find another kill? Yes, we can. Shut them. Picked up there by Valley. He's got oh, double stun. It's fantastic. Strangle falls though. Shun fire. It's just been so clean on the Zyra. Harry takes off a kill to the side. The Ignite gets it in the end. Tien now finally rocks up to the fight, and Harry stuck between three. Can't do much about that one. Kevy flashing away from the Nautilus ult to make sure two members don't get locked in place. But Tien says 1v4 time. Yeah, we eat those for breakfast. He takes down Alodoric. And that frozen heart Nautilus just wants to be an Aurobot. How how unfortunate. How bad is that feel, Skimmy? You finally find the kill onto Fido. It goes on to, you know, your carry violet, but you get that shutdown on Lemus, all that gold. You want it going to Harry, but that ignite go picks it up for Alodoric. It's so unfortunate your carries aren't getting this gold because it is so crucial that these members get to the items as fast as possible because, you know, when you look at the side of Ground Zero, how fast they can take these objectives, how fast they can speed the game up, it is getting very, very scary if you're a stand right now. Yeah, past the point of control. It's um, hit that critical threshold of embarrassment, to say the least. As we see here, 21 minutes in, what can we find? 14k down, apparently gold. picked up, shutdown is dead. Nice bit of pocket money for Harry to utilize. Can we get much more than that, Woe? As Valet takes a 1v1 on Salimis, rudely interrupted there by Fido. Gurak yet again! Denied death! We still need to find a perfect nickname from Tally, but we're in the middle of a team fight. Alatoric is under threat from three different members, and Fido puts an end to it. Respawn fight, respawn fight, Skimmy. They do get the 1,000 gold onto Harry, though, so he is going to be able to pick up his Essence Reef on reset, but Fido already tipping the bot side, and it's really him picking up that uh, inhibitor tower for his team, and breaking the base is a, a sure sign of what is to come for the rest of this game. I mean, it certainly is. Single-handedly winning the game for him for PvE Andy. We don't mind that, though, because the TP's going to guarantee the wave stays around a little bit longer, and one inhibitor is exposed. The second has been claimed. And uh, this is really Grand Zero saying, all right, let's pick up the pace a little bit here, guys. Let's really try and put some checkmate conditions in place to make sure that we can win this game. And they kill it. Tien soaking up the ultimate from the fountain itself. Ashoro connects. Out goes the all out. True short brush to try and land to buy Pippin. Buy Pippin at dives first. Tien refuses in the end. It literally took the entire might of Bliss to remove a lonely poppy. He is so tanky, Skibby. Picks himself up the locket as well. So that is so sad for Skibby. Not for you, Skibby, but this is a fight coming. I'm very sad right now, Tally, as a team fight's about to occur, and it doesn't seem to be a one in which Team Bliss are able to get any kind of comeback potential. Out goes the Requiem. There is the culling. There is the damage to try and find something, but Kevy is bleeding. He's blinking. He just survived from a single Ignite tick taking him down. And oh my gosh. It just feels like we're no longer playing League of Legends, we're playing Tower Defense. Okay, this is becoming a very action-packed game, Skimmy. Maybe just fighting non-stop is the way to get back in the game, because Bliss, uh, you know, even if they do fall down, you know, three or four times for every kill they do get onto the member of Ground Zero, every single time they get a kill, it counts for a lot, Skimmy. There is so much experience to be gathered from killing these high-level high level members, and finding these shutdowns, getting the gold onto the correct members on your comp is so important. And if we do finally get to see the three items come forward, maybe this damage makes up for you know, how long it takes to kill certain champs, especially TN. Yeah, look, I mean, this is just crazy to be this tanky. This certainly on both TN and Kurek to say, nah, we're good. All we'll pass up on that occasion. You need your entire squad to take us down. And 
Yeah, you mentioned it early on that it seemed like uh, <laughs> this is a case of go next. There is no next, unfortunately. This is game four. We were hoping that Bliss would bring us to that go next situation. And maybe they still can. Good Into down. the mid lane, they TP. The flank is successful. Biopanther looks to try and take down one more. They've removed already Lemus. He's down for 35 seconds. The final second. And that's to be picked up here by Violet. But Fido's still got the Baron. That's who has 10 seconds left to go. He just jumps at their back line and lasts as he takes down Bio. There's the Requiem now. Battle of Dorks dead before that one connects. Double then picked up by Ezreal. And this is looking like a triple inhibitor into the most super minions you've ever seen. And this is a death cap Zyra scheme. You're not used to seeing this item on the champion. You're used to seeing a lot of the uh, you know the dot items, the slows, the utilities, but shown by so fed this game. Picks up the death cap, building towards the you know his pen item, and he is gonna be doing so much damage. We really saw him pretty much one shot Al Dork in that last team fight. But the spikes are still going kind of even skimmy. Yeah, look, I don't know what to say at this stage here, Tally. I just like the fact that we're fighting. It gives me something to play by play to distract myself from that monumental gold lead. I haven't looked at the top of the board in a very long time, Skimmy. I am maintaining Hopium for a game five because, you know, we are seeing the, the, the makings of these LDRs come out of both carries for Bliss. And I think when these items start to come forward, uh, you know, maybe instead of taking 25 seconds, it takes like 15 to kill these tanks, Skimmy. They just get the stopwatch out next time they look to try and gank one of these uh, tanks and just see how long it takes because they are just Thanos and the entire Marvel Universe combined into one right now. They refuse to fall on over. And with those triple inhibitors being taken, now it's a case of all those supers crashing at once. They were the sixth member, the helping hand oh no. that Grand Zero needs to end this game once and for all. They started off by removing Biopepper. They look towards Violet and he gets sniped away. Flash the it, hook denies it, and a fountain to prevent any more from happening today. It's Kevin Harry against the world. Harry from the Afterlife, it's not to be, as he'll get dragged back in, and Grand Zero will say, that's the ace, that's match point, and this is the year of Grand Zero. 2024 belongs to the boys in green as they claim back-to-back -back titles as your LCO champions. 46 kills in a 26-minute uh, game, Skimmy. You know, every single game looks even more dominating, and it's nice to see Grand Zero look so powerful going into PCS. This is what we wanted from our first CT. We want to see the dominating performance, the clean wins. And throughout this series, every single player kept evolving. Their drafts kept evolving. And so far, I'm really impressed by this org and this team, Skimmy, and I'm really excited for what is to come. You can't ask for much more than that, Lemus. He says, I never, never miss PCS. Four for four now on all those trips for Fido and Kurak. Their first split on the team. He's eating some cake and for sure celebrate, mate. You've joined the roster and in your very first split, you've picked up your very first title to Schoenfeier at the top of the show, as we mentioned as well. He's now tied as the most successful player in LCO history with six career titles. Oh, it's just mind-boggling stuff here, Tally. Yeah, absolutely. I am so impressed with this roster. I cannot keep echoing that statement so much. I just think the overall effort they put in, the fact that they look so comfortable together as a team, and, you know, they kind of had that power of friendship aura going for them, Skinny. So I'm so excited for what is to come. Certainly lots to come. That does it from us here at the LCO, and we turn our attention towards the PCS now. We really hope that these boys can do us proud, but that's going to be us for a second. We're going to take a quick break and break it all down right after this one. Okay, would be at this point in the game, and he's a player who's extremely good at getting souls, but what an engage. There it is, there it is, that's what we've been asking for, there's the Trying to Crystal Arrow, the Strangle Fall Stop is a fantastic disengage tool, if you want to press on forwards, Zyra will not allow it, Shonfire simply says no, he's denied the comeback potential, and they'll find yet another tower, as that one is critically low. And I think that Fido has adopted the, uh,
only triple happening here is for Python. Oh, it's a boom! It's two time! Your 2024 reigning champions, Ground Zero, coming in with the goods with a four game series, taking the sweep and skimmy. Your champions are looking on form after improvement after improvement over each game. No, they certainly are. I mean, it's just testament to how good they are as those reigning champions, right? The fact that they can get crushed as cleanly as they did in game one by Bliss, bounce back, play their best champions, shrug it off like Wood off a duck's back and just laugh and say, you know what, by the time we get to game four, we're going to crush you so hard, you wish this series was quicker. I mean, it was monumental how much damage they did in this game here. Uh, and, a, and, a, and a fantastic way uh, for them to showcase this is the reason why we are the reigning champions and we will stay it for this entire year. Well, that's it. And every single game that they played today, they played something different. They had a different sort of idea of how it was going to run. Like this game in particular, the Fasting Center Tech that, like you guys said, has only been a Lima special. And again, he's played it so well. And we finally see the Ezreal in a different lane. It is in the mid lane too, but it just looks so good when this team is consistent and holding their own. Like I mentioned before, they were able to push through game after game and improve monumentally. But Tally, we have to talk about that early game. Yeah, I was uh, really curious to see that Bliss decided to go for that invade again, right? We saw how bad that turned out for them in the, the previous game, but the fact they did go for that invade and they didn't find that, you know, initial buff steal. They didn't get that successful tower dive. They didn't get the successful, you know, 1v3 outplay on their own tower dive. If that was a scrim, you know, you just, you're just screaming for a remake because it is so hard to come back from those sorts of scenarios. Look, and I think the damage is telling for itself. You see Shonefire there with 29,000 damage, along with Ezreal and Senna, your two star AD carries, just around 25,000 too. Gold, steady, steady climb for Ground Zero. Again, I think that they got their first tower as well at what, uh, seven minutes? Which yeah. is crazy. Like just the, the pressure they were putting on is just nuts. But outside of that, let's have a chat with the man on fire himself. It is Shonefire joining us on the desk after his huge victory. Mate, you must be feeling damn good. Yeah, you guys are looking good. I'm I'm feeling okay. Okay. It's a bit a bit shaky, but you know, we got the job done. Look, more than that, honestly, I think you did more than just get the job done. You 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 had a bit of a rough one in that first game, but you guys just held your own so well. You could see the mental was just like, nah nah, we got this boys, don't even stress. Is that what was going through your minds? No, we were stressing out because I wanted to have my first 3-0 final and uh, we didn't get it and we got absolutely ass blasted. So we were definitely stressing out, but I think we just uh, talked about how we're stressing out and how we should stop stressing out. And then, yeah, it went, it went mm. uphill from there. Awareness of the mind. That's And if Fido was here, he'd be like, yep, I just meditated right through it. He did half an hour's meditation in about five minutes in between those games, I can bet you that. But Shern, again, you felt so good as well. I'll pass it to Skimmy. I know he's got something for you. Yeah, well, congrats, Shern. Must feel good to be back on Oceanic Shores and just absolutely crushing it no matter what this entire year. But I want to ask you a question um, in terms of how good it feels in terms of the, the, the legacy you leave behind. This will now mean that you're tied with both Raze and Babbitt for the most successful Ose player ever. Is that something that weighs in the back of your mind, something to look back on once you know you do hang up the mouse and keyboard? Um, honestly, no. I think the biggest goal for me is to make an impact on the international stage rather than regional. Of course, it's great that um, I have whatever many titles, but the thing that I haven't done yet is like, you know, carry Oris on the international stage, to be honest. Mm. We know we, we, we spoke to Limus the other day, right? And he mentioned that you got a lot of uh, unfinished business into DCG in particular. Uh, you got our first series win last split up against V3 in the LJL. We're hoping that maybe we get like a, another favorable group stage again to try and get some more wins. But that surely is the next step. That's what we're all striving towards, right? So try and make it out of the group stage to try and go further than anybody has uh, beyond before. 100%. And also DCG are looking fire right now. Like they're actually the second seed, which is crazy because they're usually a middle of the pack team, so hopefully we'll get to face mm. them um, after we beat the fifth and sixth seed. Perfect. All right, mate. Well, congratulations again. I'll, uh, I'll pass you over the tally.
Now, uh, Skimmy talks about the past, you know, in your legacy. I want to talk about the future. You know, you keep talking about you want to have an impact and you want to finally carry O's to, you know, the glory that we've all been trying to achieve for all these years. So I want to know, uh, you know, with the form you guys are in, with the form that you're in, are you confident going into the PCS? You know, is this finally the, the right meta, the right, uh, you know, the group of players, the right group of people to really bring this forward for us? Definitely, yes. But um, as I said, like, Obviously, I'm probably going to think about this and be like, oh yeah, wait, I just won Grand Finals to kill the bag. I'm happy, but like in the moment right now, I'm not so happy with our performance uh, on a PCS level standard. So definitely going to go back and discuss and think about how we can problem solve and improve our skill level individually and as a team. Job's not done. Exactly. <laughs> well done. Damn. That's <laughs> two true words. So will you guys be boot camping over there for a little bit and getting a bit of practice over in the Taiwan server? Oh, probably. But again, I think it starts now. Like, I mean, we obviously we're going to take the night off, but I think after yeah. this night off, we definitely need to start preparing um, and helping each other get better. Like us, us and Bliss are in the same boat. We have to perform. We have to save us. Mm. Saving O's. No truer words have ever been spoken, guys. But Shen, mate, you played so well. Mega proud of you. Congratulations again. Two splits champion. Mate, hold your head high, King. You did awesome. Have a good night. Thank you, lads. Enjoy it. Oh, the power. Man, I love I love he still stayed, stayed so humble. He's just come off like a grand final win, and he's just like, nah, man, like we, we did all right. We could have done better. We got to start living up to the next level of PCS, and honestly, that's that's a fantastic mentality to have. I just think it's hilarious to me. Like, obviously, credit where it's due. You know, oh, doesn't matter how many titles I won. That's a good problem to have when you're winning that many titles. You can't even remember how many you've got, right? So I love that about it to to, to sort of kickstart the interview. But yeah, like everybody's tried. Obviously, Tally got very, very close on Legacy many, many moons ago, and we're all like trying to replicate it again. We saw what Pentanet then did the following season at MSR, and we're thinking maybe Os is on the rise. It's been a bit of a downward spiral in the last few years, right? So we're really hoping that maybe this squad in this meta, this patch, whatever it may be, this is the, the perfect chaos, the perfect storm, if you will, um, to get us one step further than we have um, done before. I think that's the big testament too, like both these teams have that shot, right? Like it is still Bliss with that star-studded roster. Yes, they've had a couple shaky games, but they've only really had shaky games against the top dogs. And the top dogs as well joining us at PCS, like both these rosters have such a huge chance to make some waves at PCS. So we'll have to see how that's going to fare out. But I think we do have some hope there, Tally. Yeah, absolutely. And I would, I mean, like to see to an extent where it's not like breaching competitive integrity where, you know, we finally work together. I want to see Grounds are in Bliss, you know, really help each other out uh, and to really represent OS well. I don't want to just see like these teams go over and have their own individual performances and, you know, we kind of just come back and we're disappointed. I want to see like the group up happen. I want to see us like represent OS because I'm confident these sides can get it done. I, I think the, the caliber of players that are going over uh, definitely have the experience and I think the coaching staff and the orgs uh, also. Uh, ready to really, you know, take it to the next level. You mentioned coaching staff, Tally. I've got a fun surprise for you because we actually have Coach Benvy of Ground Zero joining us at the desk. My boy, Big Ben, how you doing, son? Uh, wow. I'm doing well, I'm doing well, boys. And maybe I gotta get a suit like you guys if I'm uh, gonna be uh, on stage in Taiwan, so. Mate, where's that tie? Like, could even do like an imaginary one for us. Just be like, oh yeah. Mm. But no, mate, you must be feeling pretty good. You got your big victory. You are the grand champions again. How does it feel to do it now as a coach? It feels amazing, honestly. Like, uh, I mean, the way I describe the, the change from like player to coach is like the ups are not as high, but the downs are not as low. But I mean, it still feels just as good to win, honestly. Mm. You guys did such good formation. But mate, like, so are you excited for PCS? I'll jump ahead a little bit. Are you excited for PCS? You ready to take them on? Yeah, 100%. We've got to save our region. We're going over there. Going to war. Going to war, Skimmy. We're going to war. Well, it's an interesting one, right? Because obviously the entire split here in LCO, it's like we are going to war. Everybody's out for themselves. We want to be the best five players. But as soon as we do make it over to PCS, uh, having been there a few times yourself, now surely there's that kind of consideration of I know what to expect. I know how to best utilize my time. Um, and a lot of the coping always comes around, well, we can do so well at these boot camps in Korea and so on, why can't we sustain those levels? So are you really hoping that with all that learned experience and also coming from a coaching perspective now, um, this will be different. This one should hopefully uh, showcase why you were so dominant domestically. 
Yeah, 100%. I mean, our whole plan, I came in with the boys at the start of the split. We have uh, three hurdles we've got to get past. First is we play Bliss first in the regular season, then playoffs and finals, and then we be a piece. What happened there? Your interview was that good. Look, Ben, maybe uh, this is why we don't have you on the cast. Me. You came on and it's been like, what, 20 seconds? You started to spill some, like, I don't know, like, industry secrets. Or, like, get him yeah, off, yeah. get him off. Cut the broadcast right now. Car carry on from where we left off. It was like the three okay. hurdles is where we left off. Yeah, three hurdles. So, yeah, our whole plan has been to do something at PCS. So that's been the goal. And, I mean, I'm going to have a presentation ready for the boys. What we're doing in PCS. Got scrims planned already or booked. Um, so yeah, we're looking ready. And uh, as to what uh, what Tally was saying, um, yeah, I'm also down to work with Bliss. I already told Poltron when it, when we both qualified that we should scrim at least once and and see what meta reads we both pick on up on, etc. So like, yeah, it's it's sort of uh, the goal is to do something. So yeah. What do you uh, what do you make of the PCS meta at the moment? Because uh, we looked at it very early on in the split here in El Sion, there were some key, uh, crucial differences, like they were playing a lot of Sejuani, a lot of Rumble in comparison to us. Um, but for the most part, it does seem fairly similar. Also, we have those outbound cases like DCG that are going to play literally anything under the sun, like a Trindamir mid, and you can think, all right, maybe they're a little bit too crazy for us. But do you feel like this is probably the best shot we've had compared to when you've been there before? Yeah, for sure. I think we have the most like well-rounded team. I mean, we don't. you can see we don't have like the most best individuals like coming into the split like it, it would see on paper a downgrade i mean obviously support's probably a downgrade um but kurak got good coming in um no i'm joking though no. it's probably an upgrade let's see um nah kurak's great uh he's probably got more hands than me um but now that i'm in the coaching role i can make sure we're all on the same page right so that's where we can bring the advantage from the coaching role and the support role so now we have a good support and i can also still give my expertise as well um to get everyone on the same page, I guess. Speaking of Kurak, obviously he's had a phenomenal series, or a phenomenal split rather. I mean, it was a fantastic series as well, but the level of growth he's displayed has been phenomenal. Like to, to come into some of these games and bully out veterans like Draco and Eladoric in the in the fashion that he did. I mean, me and Telly have been struggling to come up with a nickname for him because how many times has he been down to like 10% and gets away and you're thinking, what does this guy know that we don't? It's like the Ben V effect of like, come get me guys, I'm a support, but then like, but I live, I win these. Uh, uh. Yeah, he's, he's sort of mastered the Benvy effect, it seems. Uh, normally I'd die and win the game, he's, he lives and wins the game still, so he's definitely one after me there. Um, but no, Kurek's great, like, the kid has no, like, uh, 
he's not scared or anything playing against these players. He'll just play and like he's mm. just good enough to play. So it's been very easy coaching him. Um, he just listens. He improves fast. Um, really no complaints from me. Great player. I suppose one final question for me before I pass you over to Tally. Uh, be it both support mains, have you spent more time individually working with him to uh, get those up to the same standard, I suppose, and also getting you a little bit more exposure to, to the life? Because this would be that first time, big playoffs, first time obviously going overseas for this as well. We heard before the series, like the struggles of his school saying like, oh, we're not sure if we can let you go to Taiwan. Surely though, like at this stage you say, look guys, I play games professionally, but I have homework too. Yeah, nah, um, yeah, we definitely at the start of Split, we did a lot of one-on-ones, um, and, and the option's always open, and, uh, having the insight, like, especially when he's making the same mistakes, is very easy to just fix, but the thing with mm. Crack is he improves just so fast that a lot of the time I don't need to, so I can, I can spend time on other things or team aspects, but whenever he's struggling with something, yeah, we can just tackle it and it gets done in, like, an hour, so it's pretty chill. Fantastic, so malleable, the perfect player, you'd say to Telly. <laughs> Absolutely, and, uh, I guess I want to ask because you know you've been a player and a coach, right? And while you were be, while you were a player, you know you were doing some coaching on the side as like a side gig thing, right? So now that you have stepped into that you know full time coach role and it has gone up a level, you have won both as the player and the coach. I want to know uh, which one do you really enjoy more, or has like it been a, a different journey so far? Um, it's like I said before. I mean, I think the peaks are not as high, like. Uh, just like the adrenaline you feel of actually winning the game, like it's not as high when you're watching or coaching. Um, but the fulfillment's still there, and the lows are definitely not as low. Like you don't, it doesn't feel like your whole sort of value as like a, a player is tied to how you perform in your last game, um, which is nice. And I think that my skill set's probably more suited to coaching, so I, I think mm -hmm. it's a great change. And it's probably the perfect time where I've done it. I played, I was the best support last split, I won the title, I can end on a high note and uh, then do it again as coach, so it's great. And to touch on, you know, you, you said, you know, with Kurak, you work on patching stuff up with him, but I think Ground Zero as a team, every time we've seen you guys, you know, have a shaky game, but you still ended up winning, there were those, uh, you know, scenarios where it looks quite shaky. And I think that, you know, going to the next week, all of a sudden, you know, Grand Zero just looks like a dominating team again. And would you say that is due to, you know, the coaching that you are providing for the rest of the team? Or do you think that is more coined towards the players? I mean, it's, it's both, right? Like, I, I can only do so much. And at the end of the day, they're playing. So they all learn and, and put in just as much effort. But um, yeah, I mean, I'm trying to put in a ton of effort. And we look back and we see, like, our, our scrim notes from when we started and the things we were working on. And now we look back and it's like our mid game was like the worst thing in the first couple of weeks. And now it's like something where I know if we get into mid game and we're not that far behind, we just win in the game. So, yeah. And, and I guess my final question for you is, uh, you know, since you have played with the, you know, your roster as that player, you know, stepping into that coaching position, have you ever found it difficult to like, uh, you know, earn respect or like you know, put, get your point across to these players? Because a lot of the players on your team are, you know, extremely uh, veteran heavy and you know, they do have loud voices. They are well-respected players. So have you ever found it difficult to, you know, sometimes work with your team or do you just think it has been just the boys the whole time? Mm. Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question because like it, it's a complete like shift of dynamic. Um, I was surprised of actually how easy it was. I just instantly had that respect until like, basically it felt like it was mine until I messed up and I wasn't going to mess up. So like, so that was perfect. And I think it also helped that we brought in two new players to the team. So it's like also a fresh mm -hmm. roster as well. Um, so it's not like only me changing. I think if it was only me, it would be a lot harder, but um, yeah, no, nah, it clicked well. And the veterans just, uh, I guess, uh, already respected me. So they were down to listen and, and, and talk, so yeah, it was pretty easy. Maybe not enough respect though, that you managed to convince them to play a high mid I'm sure in all your wisdom there, there was a moment where you're thinking, this is the angle, Kurek. There were talks, there were talks. So it was like, maybe yeah. Benvy Dinger needs to come save us from Bliss, all right? <laughs> I had to remind him, get that little like Benvy signature underneath the draft. Like, <laughs> I did that, guys. That's why we won. <laughs> yeah, um, but we didn't need to pull it out yet. So we, we'll keep that one in the pocket. We'll save that for PCS and hope they haven't got their, uh, their, their study the strategy behind you uh, last actually, one for me before i let you oh go ahead telly I, know, I was gonna jump in i just wanted to ask you know since we've had what eight nine weeks of ground zero so far and we've only seen this one play style of you guys is this all for ground zero or no is there actually still more in the uh you know the kitchen that you guys have been cooking mm. i mean of course not all the stuff in the kitchen comes out i mean we've finally got to play lee molder um 100 yep. percent scrim win rate so we knew that one was a w when we get to pick that um, we just know that this is the best meta right now, and so we honed it and became the best at it. And if the meta changes, we will figure out what is best in the meta, and then we'll play that. 
um, and, and work around the strengths and weaknesses of our players. That's just how we're going to do it. Mm, well, congratulations again. I have to ask, though, how are we celebrating tonight? Obviously, it's a Monday, so not the ideal situation of going out with the boys and having a bit of fun. But uh, what, are we, what are we thinking? Back to work tomorrow or do you drink tonight? Uh, now the players can relax. I mean, they should celebrate today and uh, have a couple of days off and then we get back to work ready for PCS. Beautiful. Well, congratulations as always, mate. You've done it as a player. You've done it as a coach. The perfect gear for yourself, for the organization, for the boys. Uh, yeah, do us proud. We'll, uh, we'll all be supporting you from here. I'll try my best. Thank you, guys. There you have it. There you have Good insight. Very really good insight there from Benvy. It was actually great to have a conversation with him. I know he's been dying, dying to get Every on the week. broadcast back again. Every, every single time Grand Zero plays, like, oh, can I get an interview? Dally. Dally, hey. <laughs> hey. But no, I like the I like the sentiment of the whole, you know, job's not done. I, I like that approach and uh, I'm confident, you know, for what we've seen so far going into PCS. Welcome back, Pike. You missed out on a banger one. I'm sure you got to watch a little bit on the sidelines, but yeah, look, we had some tech issues like you wouldn't believe. I'm genuinely so upset because I love Benvy. I always <laughs> love having a chat with Benvy and he's been pestering me as well. Be like, Pike, when do I get an interview? I was like, man, I want it. Like, I'm asking for it. Nothing. Nothing. And then I disconnected. Everything went nuts. That's okay, but we're back. Mm -hmm. We're here. And we've got an MVP we've got to talk about, boys, because it is the player that we all thought stood above the rest. It was Lemus. He is not only your MVP for the series, but your overall split to MVP with four votes in total. The Lee Mulder was just too much, Tally. Yeah, absolutely. As I did say earlier, we delayed this MVP because, you know, there was still that tie in the first place. But after this series, to me, Lemus is on a career high. He has played, the, you know, the split of his career. His form right now is insane. The meta is perfect for him. All these champions he is so successful on. And I, I could not think of a, a player better to represent us going towards PCS. And he's just stood so far above. Like, he is his improvement, let alone just in his role, but his team communication, how he's actually played, it's just leaps and bounds from what we're used to in the past, too. So, this man, absolutely well deserving, earned it so much more than I think anyone else. And I'm super proud that he got it. And I know he's probably off to the side, just like having a cheeky little hehe. -he, and then he's, that's all he's going to do. Nothing I, else. I just find it uh, funny, right? Because like Lemus was originally on Bliss during the Bliss Chiefs era. Then he switches allegiances to Grand Zero, faces up against Bliss again. It's just like I'm, I'm the difference maker. It's not the org. It's not the team. It's, it's me. So <laughs> yeah, to make it four from four is a phenomenal feat. To be then four MVPs on top of that might just be his lucky number now, Pike. Fours. Well, is he going to start playing Jin? We'll have to wait to True. see in PCS. That's the big part. But we got our play of the day that we have to bring up. And it was a bit of a different one because we couldn't really decide <laughs> on the best play of the day. But it was actually the one, I believe, where we saw Fido just die at the Dragon Pit. But then they still somehow flipped the whole game on its side there, Skimmy. Well, that's exactly right. Yeah, you're thinking, what on earth is Fido doing? And it ended up being, oh, actually, he's the greatest player in this entire lobby. 1-5, baits them into a team fight. And then after this, Grand Zero 4v5, win the entire game. Puts them on match point. Look, I mean, this is crazy. Absolutely crazy. Once again, you're thinking, in what world does a Lucian dash like this? He says, now watch this, guys. I'm thinking 18 steps ahead. Look, they say that uh, Benvy's been cooking some stuff up in the kitchen. That was definitely fine. I'd be like, oh, I can cook too. Whipped out the spatula and just said, ah, oh, no, nah, wrong tool. And sadly, the rest of his team's just like, oh, don't worry. We got the ladle. We got the spoon. We're all good. And then they took the soup to the bank and said, easy peasy, lemon squeezy. That was a lot of cooking puns in there, but no, what a good a play, honestly. Fido doing a very good job. I think Fido did have a bit of a rough time in these series. I think Harry definitely gave him a run for his money, but it was all came down to that team coordination. We really saw Fido being able to facilitate his team a little bit more, and that play really stands to, to prove that tally. Yeah, Fido just has a much easier time in the uh, you know the mid game. I think that uh, Churn and Correct in particular are just really good at enabling sidelines to just do what they need to do. And Lemus, most of the time when he hits that you know 17, 18 minute mark, starting to get mid priority because he's either playing a scaling champion or he's just really fed from the early game when he does like to lock in those early game champs. So mm. all of a sudden it's really easy to you know just be Fido on this team because the rest of your team just does so well. Yeah, well, on top of that, we do need to wish these two fantastic teams the best of luck heading over to the PCS. Don't forget, we will be tuning out. There is the Twitch link as well, dash LOL Pacific. I don't know why I said LOL. It's meant to be LOL, but that's okay. We've got to give them all the props. We've got to support our team, so definitely tune into those streams when they do go up. They'll be heading over fairly soon, but best of luck, boys, and good luck out there. It's going to be a good time, Skimmy. 
saluting emoji in the chat. We've been doing it this yep. entire series. I mean, look, and this entire season. I keep saying, yeah, series, season. They all blend together. We're, we're gone with this waving meta. It's all about saluting the boys as they go on to do us well. So do we do a saluting koala now? Can, is that something? Can we change the well, koala to a salute? I, I feel like me and Tally have got this idea. It's like, it's a salute, and then they do well. Absolute the cinema, cinema, boys. That's what we want. <laughs> 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 All right. Well, gents, sadly, the news is here that that is the last LCO broadcast. We are done and dusted for the split, and it's been an absolute honor working with both of you. Any final thoughts before we wrap up? It's just, it's a dream, isn't it? It's, it's, it's so fun just to get paid to, to, to talk about games, to play games, uh, to, to do a passion as a, as a, as a bit of a job for a meantime. It's, uh, yeah, great, great to be alongside you boys, to have Tally on here to sort of see another side of life, I suppose. Be a player, now you get to talk about it. For yourself, having grinded so hard there, Pike, you finally made it to the top of the top. So, yeah, it's, um, it's been great to be on this journey with you boys. Right. Absolutely. Day, tally. I yeah, I'm I'm honored to like be able to cast. You know, I love talking about league and being able to talk about my favorite region all the time, especially with you guys, is so fun. Don't know what the future holds, you know, for the rest of uh you know the, the LCO, but uh, I'm excited regardless of what happens and I hope that if the opportunity presents itself I can, you know, represent OS again in some way. Well, boys, as always, you know me. The grind has been real, but we've made it, and I'm so chuffed that I just got to spend every second I could with all of you. But from all of us here at the LCO, of course, for the last time this split, I've been Papa Pike, that's been Tally, that's been Skimmy. From all of us here, we'll see you on the next Oceanic Adventure. Good night. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.